So I'm here with Suzanne Wainwright Evans, and we're talking about various pests, and we're going to start off talking about the root aphid. Can you tell me a little bit about that in relation to cannabis? Yes. I, I don't want to say everybody has it, but I think almost everybody has it at this point. Um, and the reason I wanted us to kind of start here is because I'm getting contacted through Instagram several times a day, which is, is fine. Um, but people are sending me pictures of their root aphids and their not root aphids. Um, in fact, I've had a few situations where people have actually been treating for several years thinking they had root aphids and they're not root aphids. Oftentimes it's either a fungus gnats or now I'm actually having a lot of people uh, get mites confused with root aphids. Um, mm -hmm. Remember, mites have eight legs as adults. Um, when mites are first, uh, first born, they only have six, but then when they molt, they'll get eight. And generally when they're first hatched out of the eggs, people don't see them. They don't see them until they're later in life and, and bigger. And then they'll have eight legs where insects, which is what aphids are, they'll always just have six legs and then their antenna. So don't count their antenna as, as legs. And so you've got to start there because how we manage mite issues is very different in how we manage aphid issues. Um, I've actually, I'm saving a whole a file on my computer of things people have thought were root aphids uh, that aren't. And, and the concern is, is people are doing all these Bavaria drenches uh, with, or uh, Isaria using these two different fungi, uh, which we're using for root aphid management, but they don't really do anything for mites. So it's just people are wasting a lot of money and a lot of products going out when it doesn't need to. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about them a bit. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about their, about their life cycle. I, you mentioned already the adults, the flying adults look a lot like fungus gnats and people are confusing those. I know I've had a tough time looking at a sticky card telling them apart unless they were side by side. So what are some of the key characteristics throughout the etymology of the life cycle of this pest? So um, general, okay, so with fungus gnats, when they're adults, they all fly. Uh, the larvae are white maggots in the soil, and they have a black head capsule, um, and that's how you can tell fungus gnat larvae from other fly species in the soil, um, and typically, they bounce around on the soil surface, and they have this very weird little flight pattern they do, and that's why when we put out sticky cards for fungus gnats, we typically have them closer to the soil profile and not up in the high top part of the canopy. The, the canopy we, is where we put more for uh, things like thrips. But down towards the soil, um, that's where you can find the fungus gnats bouncing around. Aphids, most of the time they don't have wings. They develop wings when it's time for them to disperse. And typically what I'm seeing, um, especially in cannabis, but this can be true because there, there's several species of root aphids, and there's some that attack vegetables, some attack ornamentals, some attack cannabis. But basically, they all kind of hang out in the soil until there's either an environmental cue or something um, like their population gets too high, and then it's time for them to disperse. And this is what's happening in cannabis, is people think, oh my gosh, in flower, we have this massive, all of a sudden, root aphid issue. It's been there the whole time. It's just the numbers have been really low. They've been hanging in the soil, reproducing, feeding on the plant, not developing wings. And then when they get to a certain number or environmental cues may play into this too, which we don't know yet, but they decide, okay, now we're going to have babies that are going to develop wings. And then that's when you see them coming out of the soil and dispersing. And you may be like, oh no, I've seen them crawling around with no wings. What you're seeing are immatures that haven't developed their wings yet. I was just at a facility a few weeks ago and we collected a bunch of root aphids and we looked at them under, you know, my Dynalite. By the way, I got a new Dynalite. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, uh, but you can actually see what are called like wing pads and that's where the aphid wings are going to develop from. So even though you don't see full blown wings on them, you can see on the immature aphids where the wings are going to develop. And that's just something that as you look at aphids over and over and over again, you can start to see them. So you can see these aphids that are climbing around by the, the hundreds or thousands. If you look at them, you can see these wing pads and know that when they're going to shed their skin into the next life stage, uh, when they get to the adult part of it, they will have wings. So, so 
take me through the life cycle of, of an aphid. Okay. Like, where, so, where does it start? So for, um, so for root aphids, it's a little different than regular aphids, just a little bit. But basically, aphids do a thing called parthenogenesis, and that means they do not have to mate to have babies. So basically, all their offsprings are clones of themselves. And this is why there's a lot of problems with insecticide resistance, where people use the same product over and over, you know, natural pyrethrins. Um, if you use them over and over, and if mom developed resistance since her offspring are clones of her, they're going to have resistance too. And so that's why it's very easy to develop resistance in aphids and insecticides. And the female, as once she, be, she is an adult, she just sits there and will have live birth for the most part. This, this is um, in, in warmer climates and inside of greenhouses, uh, we generally don't see them laying eggs. Um, there's in my entire life, I've only seen one species do it, and that's the cannabis aphid. They're kind of doing their own weird thing. Um, so we'll just, we'll talk about them in a second. But so inside your greenhouse with cotton melon, with your green peach, with even your root aphid, um, what you're seeing is just one female just having live birth all the time in their clones of herself. So, and it just goes on year round. Now, if you're an outside producer of any plants in the northern climate, they do overwinter as eggs. And so when the days get shorter and uh, the temperatures start to fall, uh, aphids then actually will produce some male offsprings. They'll mate and then the females lay eggs and then they overwinter as eggs. And then in the spring, those hatch and off to the races again. But in protected environments where they don't get those environmental cues, they just have babies year round. And, you know, I, I work a lot in South Florida, you know, outside just babies year round kind of thing. So, but for some reason, and, and we're not sure exactly why yet, the cannabis aphid, the actual cannabis aphid, not aphids on cannabis, but the, the species, the cannabis aphid, it actually, it is laying eggs inside of greenhouses, but it, well, facilities that are using artificial lighting and we're actually seeing cannabis eggs and we think it's when people are changing uh, their lighting and temperature to trigger the plants to flower that's triggering the cannabis aphid to go into egg laying so that's like this one weird exception we're seeing and i've seen it in canada united states southern western united states eastern you know kind of all over this happening okay so with these live births, you get these little tiny, are they considered, is that a, considered a larval stage at that point or is it the actual? I just call it an immature, an immature, but it looks just like mom, but it's a miniature version because okay. insects basically have two ways that they can grow up and become adults. They have uh, things like aphids that when they're born, they look just like the adults. They're just smaller versions. And each time they molt, they get a little bigger. It's the same thing with uh, stink bugs do that. On the flip side of that, you have insects like uh, butterflies. You know, the eggs are laid when they hatch out. Their immature stage does not look like the adult at all. And uh, so they actually have to go through, you know, complete metamorphosis to completely change. And so um, caterpillars, uh, caterpillars do that. Uh, flies do that. Uh, beetles do it, you know, ladybugs, you look, the larva look like little black alligators. They don't look like ladybugs. And when people see small ladybugs and they're like, oh, it's a baby ladybug. It, it's like, no, that's the full size. Once you see a ladybug adult that it, they don't grow any bigger than that because they're oh. immature stage are that little alligator stage. And so that's why it's so important to know what the different life stages look like. And, you know, that's what I'm spending a ton of time teaching in my workshops. So if you do have an aphid in an egg, when that hatches, does that hatch as a little, a little baby clone as well? So uh, it'll still no, well, and this is, so when you have egg laying, generally there's a male and a female, so you can get some genetic diversity in there. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. But, but n no one has done this detailed of work yet on the cannabis aphid because of all the limitations of who can study it and moving it and yada, 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 all that stuff. 
Okay. So in terms of plant health and plant damage with the cannabis aphid versus the root aphid, what are, are there any distinguishing characteristics in terms of how it affects plants? Or are they still using the same mechanism for feeding? Well, they do. They, they all, all, all aphids have what's called a piercing sucking mouth part. And you basically have the plant wall here and their mouth looks like a straw and they just stick it in. And that's why they start feeding on the plant juices. They don't actually chew the plant or take away pieces of the plant. And this is why historically systemic pesticides have worked so well because they're moving in the, the liquid fluid of the plant and you know you just tap your straw in there and you suck it right up. And that's why systemics do work well on, on aphids. But um, as you know, um, one, it can lead right back to a lot of resistance issues. And there's a lot of crops we can't use systemics on and including cannabis is one you definitely don't want to be using a systemic on. But what I see with um, the root aphid is an overall just decline in plant health. They just don't look as vigorous. The color can be slightly off. It just stresses the plant. And usually when they're in like propagation, the numbers are so low, you don't notice it. And it's over time as the populations build and as the plants get closer to flower all of a sudden you have thousands of these aphids feeding on their roots and it, it can really stress a plant especially add in any nutritional stress then you put disease you know all these different factors and you know typically people are pushing cannabis plants pretty hard to grow for certain characteristics that we want and they're pushing yeah. with fertilizer and that just adds into the stressors on there um, but with the cannabis aphid, they're feeding on the foliage of the plant and that cause, and it's the same thing with the other foliar aphid species. Um, and they're, again, sticking their mouth parts in, but you can see more discoloration on the foliage. Also, um, when aphids feed, since they're sucking up all these plant juices, they take um, in a lot more sugar than they actually need and so what happens then is they're like well i've got this extra sugar inside of me i'm just gonna squirt it out and so they actually will squirt out what we call honeydew and it's the excess sugars they don't need as part of their diet and you actually get sticky on the leaf surface mm -hmm. and this is oftentimes when you get ants moving in because ants like to feed on that sugar um, and if it gets really bad you can get what's called sooty mold growing on it and yeah. oftentimes people think they have disease issue but it's actually all related to um, what we call piercing sucking insects whether it be aphids white flies um, and even some of the soft scales can do it but I've seen it in um, with white flies in cannabis so where are we scouting for these various aphid species? Well, with the root aphids, you need to be scouting. And I, I mean, I just think everybody should be treating and prop. I mean, and this is, people don't do enough treatment and propagation. They wait until the problem gets too bad. And it's, you don't want to wait to treat for the problem. Um, so you need to be scouting, but scouting depending on how you're growing can be very difficult. People that use the, the large living soil beds, you can't really scout for root aphids because you can't get in there and really see your roots. And once you get the root aphids in there, they just keep building and building and people end up fighting them. And basically they just try to keep them suppressed in those soil beds. Yep. Um, with the foliar aphids, um, you know, you, you go by and if you saw that video I did on Instagram a while ago where you just bang the plant onto the board, uh, aphids will fall out too when you do that as well as thrips and mites. And so that's an easy way to detect early populations on the foliar feeding aphid species. So using a bang board yeah. to get the bang aphid. <laughs> ah, boom, boom. I see what you did there. <laughs> so I know the ODA put out a report on it. I'll, I'll, I can link to that PDF. Um, it's yeah. got some photos and things like that. Have you had a chance to see that advisory? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It looks pretty good to you. It's something I yeah. can share. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's a basic overview, but the thing is, is we still just don't know a lot about it. And back to this whole egg laying thing, um, it's the first time Again, I've ever seen aphids lay eggs in a greenhouse, and it's a first time for a lot of people. I, I show the images to other entomologists, and everybody's like, whoa, because nobody's seen it. So it has a very unusual behavior about doing that. And we don't even know what really will feed on the eggs. I would assume uh, lacewing larvae would feed on them um, because – lacewing larvae will eat just about anybody and anything, including their brothers and sisters. Um, 
but it, it's something when you are scouting to be aware of because you won't readily recognize it as an aphid egg. It looks more like a yellow to black, um, almost really shiny Mike and Ike's candy. Huh. What about Aureus? Would that feed on it? It possibly would feed on it too. Okay. I mean, my dream thing to do is uh, to, you know, get a bunch of the eggs, throw a bunch of beneficials and sit on my scope for hours. Um, <laughs> But you've got to have the eggs right at the right time. You know, it's hard to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So what are some treatment options that you're aware of for root aphids or for the cannabis aphid? You know, and we've talked about stuff, um, the root aphid management in the past. And people listen closely because I had a lot of people contacting me about it and said I said things that I never, never said. <laughs> okay. So, at this point in time, as in July 11th, 2019, we are not seeing success controlling him with any of what I call the macro biocontrol agents, the row beetles, the mites, any of those kinds of things. Yes, if you put a root avid in a petri dish with a row beetle, it's probably going to eat it, but it's not controlling it. If those things work to control it, it wouldn't be such an industry-wide problem because everybody's dumping loads of this stuff out. Um, what we have seen, the, the best thing we've got going right now are the microbial, what we call the enema pathogenic fungi. They're fungi that kill insects. Um, products like Botanigard or Mycotrol, which are the Bavaria bassiana, um, and that's the GHA strain, strain has been successful. Um, but what I'm finding is when people say, I'm doing it, I'm not getting control, the product doesn't work, they suck, they're not applying it correctly. And also, for the ninth million times, the Tanagard is not a GMO product. It is not genetically engineered. Cannabis industry, uh, you know what, I need my tinfoil hat for this. And it's actually upstairs. Okay. <laughs> it is not a GMO product. Um, None of the, the microbials on the market right now. Now, they've selected them by saying, wow, this fungus works the best. So we're going to use this, but it's not genetically engineered. And I got people, you know, saying it, and, and it, it is not true. You have to fact check what you're saying out there. But that said, um, the Bavaria as a drench application, and remember, the spores have to come in contact with the aphid. It's not systemic, and you have to get contact for it to work. Uh, we're seeing good results with Isaria, which is another uh, genus of enema pathogenic fungi, and that's in the product like PFR97. Um, but again, you have to apply it correctly and get contact. Um, so how, how are you recommending applying this? I know um, I was just interviewing a buddy of mine and he was using the, uh, hold on, let me get this right, the, the DRAM BP4 with an aftermarket five-headed telescopic atomizing lance for a lot of his spray applications. Now, well, that's spraying. Not necessarily for microbial applications, but how are you applying a lot of the products you're talking about? Well, well, I mean, so, so the microbials like um, the Bavaria or Isaria, mm -hmm. so they work well on root aphids, not foliar aphids. So you, it's it's kind of somewhat complicated. So the fungus, when it's in the soil, um, does a good job in the root aphids, but for foliar aphids, it doesn't work that well because you really have to tank mix the fungus with an insect growth regulator, which are IGRs. IGRs basically disrupt insects from becoming mature adults. So basically, it's like if a 14-year-old's getting hammered with a compound that will keep them from going through puberty kind of thing. It's basically what insect growth regulators do. I'm, this is very, very loose, the way I'm sure. explaining this. But what happens is when you have an aphid, aphids shed their skin a lot really fast, the foliar aphids, and that's why you get those white flakes everywhere. If you spray and here lands your Bavaria spore, boop, or your Isaria, and then boop, it sheds its skin, there goes the spore. If you tank make it with an insect growth regulator, it stops them from molting, and so that spore can't get molted off. And so if you're talking about using these microbials for a foliar application, 
For aphids, you've got to have that IGR. Not necessarily for the root aphid species because you have 100% humidity in the soil and the fungus works fast enough down there, but on the foliage, you need that. The problem is, is when you look at insect growth regulators, most of them are disallowed in cannabis production with the one exception of azadiractin. And depending on what state you're in, if you can use azadiractin or not, but azadiractin is actually an insect growth regulator that can be tank mixed with the microbials for better foliar aphid management. So as far as the sprayer your buddy's using, that's when you would use that kind of sprayer. But treating for root aphids in the soil, you need one of more like the, the, the drenching heads that, you know, is like a yeah. heavy water because you want to get a lot of water volume to get the the fungal spores down into the soil surface into the i mean into the media through through the soil profile yeah yes thank you That's so what what i'm wondering though is how does an atomizer affect these spores is it it's not damage damaging them so the main thing that can damage spores is heat and that's why you have to be very careful with foggers. Uh, Dr. Michael Brownbridge, if you guys don't know him, you should know and follow his work up out of, he's with the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. And actually, um, if you're coming to Cultivate this weekend, I'm not sure when you're putting the podcast up, <laughs> but uh, Michael's going to be speaking on microbials this weekend at Cultivate as, as well as I am. I'm doing a presentation on how to integrate microbials with uh, – uh, traditional chemistries to use them for biocontrol agents. But Michael Brownbridge has actually been doing study uh, uh, research up at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center looking at equipment and how does putting Bavaria, Bacillus, and things like that through this equipment and how does it affect it. And generally, it's heat and pressure are two of the issues. Um, but for just regular sprayers it's usually not a problem it's with these foggers where they have really high psi and you get the yeah. heat and the heat cooks and kills them yeah i looked at uh this was oh, probably almost a decade ago i looked at some compost tea through a uh, fogger and it it destroyed everything um, yeah even the bacteria was was yeah well there's cold foggers and yeah. uh and dram makes one um and again that's the stuff if you i you can probably put a link in this um for the work that michael's been doing on testing the stuff okay the all right so anything else on aphids before we move on to a different pest um i just you know, just ID. I'm, I'm willing to help everybody. You guys know that because you guys are taking full advantage of me, <laughs> uh, which is okay. But, you know, just count legs. If it has eight, it's a mite. If it's got six, it's a spider. I mean, it's a spider. What am I saying? It's an insect if it has six. You know, if there's, you know, antenna, insects have antenna, um, you know, just basic things like that. And that's why, I mean, I'm not going to completely promote myself but yes come to one of my classes that does basic insect id so that you guys can learn this stuff 